Good day, folks. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. It's Leon from Back 40 Bees from Northwestern Pennsylvania. I'm a newbie beekeeper that enjoys the podcast, running a few Lands hives and a couple Langstroths. Have a good day. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flottam. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thank you, Sherry, and a quick shout out to all of our sponsors whose support allows us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Be sure to check out all of our content on our website. There you can read up on all our guests, read our blog on the various aspects and observations about beekeeping, search for, download, and listen to over 200 past episodes, read episode transcripts, leave comments and feedback on each show, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Hey, Leon, thanks a lot for that fantastic opening to the show. Folks, you know, you too can help us open the next episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. Simply record yourself with a greeting, welcoming others to the show, and tell us a little bit about yourself, where you are, how many bees you keep, perhaps even like Leon did, the types of hives you have. Send it to questions at Beekeeping Today podcast, and we'd be happy to post it in a future and upcoming show. Speaking of upcoming shows, joining Kim and me in just a few minutes will be Dr. Anthony Nierman of the USDA ARS Beltsville Bee Lab. He'll be talking to us about his recent research about bee longevity. I don't know about you, but this spring has taken a long time to get here. Actually, I think for most of the country, you are enjoying spring. In the Pacific Northwest, we're a little behind on times and the weather. I was actually reading a weather report this last uh, couple days ago that March has been the coldest ever recorded spring in the Pacific Northwest. And I can attest to that. In fact, our bees coming up from California are several weeks late. And those of us waiting for packages and nukes from the south uh, still have not yet received them. And they're looking for them next week or the week after. So fingers crossed. That said, I hope your spring is going well and your bees are off to a great start. One of the main reasons I keep bees is to harvest honey. But the thing about harvesting honey I don't like is the smell of fume boards. That's where Fisher's Bee Quick comes into play. Fisher's Bee Quick provides a stink-free way of using your fume board. This week, if you use the promo code HIVETOOL, you can receive a 15% discount when you order from Amazon.com. So check it out on Amazon.com, HIVETOOL, Fisher's Bee Quick. Get it today. Are you interested in learning more about climate change and its impact, potential impact on beekeeping and on agriculture and all of us in general? Then you'll want to check out Kim's new blog on growingplanetmedia.com. He's been writing about the research he's been doing on the effects of climate change. It is something you really want to keep track of, and I encourage you to check that out at www.growingplanetmedia.com and click on the blog page to find out more. And before we get into today's show with Dr. Anthony Nierman, I wanted to give you a peek at the future with some upcoming episodes here on Beekeeping Today podcast. Next week, we have a talk with Mandy Shaw of Beekeeper Confidential, another podcast on beekeeping. 
week after that, we have a talk with Steve Bookman. He's the author of the book, What a Bee Knows. It's a fantastic interview. Really hope you can join us for that. Week after that, we're talking to Bill Hesbach out of Connecticut about varroa mites. And later in May, we are talking with Amy Vu from the University of Florida Extension Service. She's going to be talking to us about what they're doing there in Florida and with her about her podcast with Dr. Jamie Ellis, uh, Two Bees in a Pod. So we have some fantastic shows lined up and many more through the summer. Make sure you keep listening to Beekeeping Today podcast. With that, let's get on with today's show. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. This episode is sponsored in part by Blue Sky Bee Supply. Check out blueskybeesupply.com for the best selection of honey containers, caps, lids, and customized honey labels. Enter coupon code PODCAST and receive 10% off an order of honey containers, caps, lids, or customized honey labels. Offer ends December 31st, 2023. Some exclusions apply. Hey, beekeepers! Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is Anthony Nierman from the University of Maryland Bee Lab, Beltsville, Maryland. Correct me, Anthony. (laughs) All of those things. You're in Maryland. I can say that for sure. Welcome (laughs) to the show. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Nice to meet you, Anthony. You too, Kim. Anthony, we've invited you to the show to talk about some of the research you're doing there at the University of Maryland Bee Lab. Why don't you give us a little bit about yourself, your background with bees, and what got you to this point, and then we'll dive into what you're working on. So years ago, sort of as I was sort of transitioning out of my, my previous life and in, into my new life as an academic, I had finished my undergrad at the University of Maryland and was just kind of looking for just some lab experience to kind of get my footing in, in a lab and figure out what I wanted to do as, you know, as a, as a, as a grown up. One of my, one of my friends was working in, in the B lab and said, Hey, these people are great. You got to come check it out. You should come get a job here. So I started, so I started working at the B lab and, and that's, that's where they run the B informed partnership. And, most, and I just started out just kind of working a few hours a week here and there and, and helping out in the B yard and, and that kind of thing. And then I think when I started to really get hooked was actually the first time that I, I actually got stung. We were out in the bee yard and, you know, I, I hadn't been around or really thought about bees much since I was a little kid. So everybody's, everybody's waiting for me to get stung to see what happens. Oh, is he going to, he's going to have a reaction. So I'm kind of just hanging back. I'm watching them install packages and setting up an apiary. And like, and I just sort of, I'm a designated photographer. So I'm taking pictures. And at some point a bee stings me right, right on my eye, right here. And so everybody's, so some people are freaking out and some people are trying to, to, to see what's going to happen. And they're waiting and, you know, 20 minutes goes by, 30 minutes go by, nothing happens, no reaction, not, nothing at all. But it was just, you know, it was fun, the camaraderie, but also the, you know, the worry. And then, but it combined with the, you know, handling the packages and setting up the bees and just the whole thing, that whole day was just really just a wonderful experience. And I, and I started to think, well, I could really, I could really get into this. And so I, I, I ended up applying for a full-time job in the lab and, and, and working for, for the bee lab and being informed for a couple of years and kind of traveling around, meeting beekeepers and, and, you know, learning everything I could and just sort of just, you know, fell in love with bees, fell in love with the people. The, the department is great too, really like the people there as well. And after a couple of years of that, I was like, well, I think I've, I've, I've pretty much made up my mind here. I'm going to go to grad school and, and, and get a graduate degree studying honeybees. So I just, and I just graduated in December, so I'm a, newly minted doctor, as it were. 
that's pretty much how I got to sitting before you here today. Well, congratulations. Newly minted. Thanks. That's fantastic. Now, I have to ask, we were chatting before we started recording. Prior to your decision to buckle down and get serious into school, how much playing of the guitar were you doing? I spent more time in college playing guitar than I think studying. I have to ask. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No. So I actually... I didn't follow the traditional path in life. My undergraduate spanned my late 20s into my early 30s. And so I want to say at the time, though, I wasn't doing a whole lot of playing at university, but I was in a couple of bands at the time. And, and we were you know, probably playing in D.C. and Baltimore, playing out a whole bunch. I think we might have recorded a record or two or something like that. So I would say pretty frequently, but it was it was more <laughs> for the purpose of, you know, going out and playing live less, you know, for the try, trying to impress people around campus or something. Fantastic. Well, we'll get back to bees, but thanks. That's fun. Brings back memories. The reason we asked you to the show is your recent research on honeybee longevity. And you have a couple different research papers out on that? It's actually just one comprehensive paper that that sort of spans into the, the, the longevity research. Give us some background and why you chose that topic and let's talk about that. Yeah, it was it was a really interesting kind kind of one of those, you know, aha moments in science where I was I was studying and, and one thing I had a good experiment going then and it and it just sort of landed this information just sort of landed in my lap. It was early early in my like first couple of years of grad school I was trying to figure out you know how to how to maneuver myself with bees in a laboratory setting. Like I knew I wanted to be a lab researcher and, and a little bit less so much of doing field research. So I was trying to learn those those different experiments in the lab where you take bees and you put them in cages and, and you do experiments. And I was looking for a good, interesting way to learn that. And I, and, and I thought, well, I've been reading all these standardized protocols for, for, for taking care of bees in the lab, and they don't mention anything about supplementing water. And I know that there's publications that, that supplement water. I know that that's an important thing for beekeepers when they're, they're hunting down a, a holding yard. So I said, all right, well, I, this is something that's at least a good question to ask. It's really straightforward. And then I'll just see, do bees live longer when you give them access to water when they're in cages? And unsurprisingly, they do. <laughs> um, so I gave them a couple of different types of water. And 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 in, in every case, they you know those bees live longer. You're a grad student. You're like, yes, I got an experiment. I got results that I can talk about. So now you got to start, you know, start writing up the results. And so I started researching the, the different publications of where cage studies were happening, whether they were using water, whether they weren't using water. And I started to notice that some of the publications listed lifespans that were way longer than anything I had experienced in my experiment. So at first, my first inclination was that I, I had done something wrong. So I started digging deeper and started collecting data on these, these, these publications, trying to figure out if there were details that were different, different than mine. And but what I found out was that the historic publications, like from the 1970s, were those bees were consistently living longer. So I collected a whole bunch of data, like very scientifically and in, in, in spreadsheets, and I did the analysis on it. And it turns out that over time, over the past 50 years, at least in the United States, is where we have a bunch of good data, the bees weren't living as long. In fact, they were living about half as long. So this was kind of one of those very surprise moments of like this is kind of too big a deal to be to be real to be true. So then then the paper itself this particular publication I went I explore a different couple of different areas like honey production and maybe there's some there's some stuff about theoretical models in there as well like the the behave model is one of the things I used to explore it as well. And really the work just presents a bunch of evidence that but there's a there's a good chance that at least in the United States bees bees may not be living as long as they used to. What you've just said brings up two major questions in my mind is you are giving them water plus what? What were you giving them before you started giving them water? Just sugar syrup? So I was giving them a 50% sucrose solution with some type of pollen substitute, right? Probably mega bee or something like that, which in the, I think there's like the, the Colos bee book, they have their standardized methods for, for rearing bees in the lab. And what they say is that a 50% sucrose solution is good enough for hydrating bees, but they don't provide any sort of reference for that. They just kind of say it. And then it's also recommended, and there's a, a number of publications that explore the idea of, should we be giving bees in the cages pollen substitute or pollen? And it's really, it's a difficult thing to, to standardize, right? Pollen's different wherever you go. 
you know, not all pollen substitutes or pollen patties are created equal either. So there's sort of mixed results in the research on on their effectiveness, but overall, you know, alpha and some type of protein is good too. So I wasn't just giving them water. I had my control group was uh, was just 50% sucrose solution and 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 pollen patty. And then the control groups had all of that plus different types of water that they had access to. So I don't I don't, I can't say for certain that they were drinking it, but I know that I can say for certain that they were taking it out of the out of the feeders. That much I know. Going back to the work that was done in the 70s and before that, exactly the same thing, that same solution and the same protein source? It was a kind of a mixed bag. So that was one of the things that I was kind of testing when I started collecting data on all those previous experiments was I was looking at, all right, well, what was the lifespans that were reported? What was the dietary variables that were included? If they did include water, did they mention what type of water they included? You know, did they use honey? Did you know what was the the incubator settings? All, all those kinds of things too, to see like, and then I was sort of incrementally testing. Well, which, which one of these seems to have you know some sort of relationship with with the differences in lifespan? But time was the big predictor in that one. That none of, none of the dietary variables really came out as as anything all that strong. The diet of the bees in the seventies and before that was essentially the same as the diet you are using now but you're adding different kinds of water. Your variable is the water, not the carbohydrate source and the protein source. At least that gives you something, a good thing to measure. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. I mean, it was, and it was just kind of happenstance that I noticed it, you know, in reading, reading the protocols. It was like, oh, wait, they didn't, they didn't reference anything there. I don't think anybody's, you know, studied that. And I certainly, I went and looked and see if I could find a publication where somebody had researched, you know, bee lifespan and, and water in cages. And, and sure enough, I couldn't find anything. You were saying that you're using different kinds of water, and I'm envisioning distilled and tap and mud puddle. And what were the different kinds of waters that you were using? And did you see much difference between any of them, some of them, or none of them? So I used, I wanted to use stuff that was sort of readily accessible in, in a lab setting. So I used the tap water that came out of the the, the faucet at, at, at my lab. And then we have, we have a nice, like, deionized water, though it's not. 100% deionized it's probably about half of what the the tap water is so still still a little bit dirty and then i use the deionized water just to make like a 1% salt solution in retrospect i think and actually a beekeeper asked me this a while ago that maybe i should have used gone and bought you know distilled water from the store and used that that might have been a good a good thing to test too but but anyways the bees that that had the tap water actually live the longest the control group bees died something like five times faster than the bees that had access to tap water. And then the other two, the, just the deionized and the and the 1% salt solution, I think the control bees died about twice as fast as those bees. So all in all, a pretty big difference by by the, I think by the third week, by about 21 days, you know, when, when most bees are hopefully moving on to be in foragers, the tap water group had retained about 67% of their population compared to about 12.5% to the control group. And then it was just, it was pretty much in between. I think it was like 37% for the the other two, the other two groups. Well, I think if nothing else, you've uh, reinforced in a big way, make water available for your bees in the bee yard. Without a doubt. It's nice to have numbers to say, yeah, you got to have water. But if you don't, your neighbors are going to find bees in their water faucets and swimming pools and things. <laughs> so so not only are you, if you provide water, not only are you saving your neighbors that kind of grief, but you're making your bees live longer. So that's two for two. You can't lose on that one, I think. Oh, yeah. No, that's a good point. <laughs> I'm going to remember that one for my next bee talk. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great opportunity to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. We know you have options when it comes to shopping for beekeeping supplies. What we believe sets Better Bee apart are three things. First, our commitment to innovating, trying out new products in our own apiaries, and then sharing them with you. Second, our focus on education and helpful customer service. And third, but not last, our fundamental company goal, to help you be a successful beekeeper. Give us a call to learn more about any of our products or to ask a beekeeping question. We've got you covered. Visit BetterBee.com to shop online today. So you found out that bees are living longer. I mean, as simple as providing water in a cage 
And I'm going to guess that you could probably measure that in a hive somehow. You could put them in a location where there is no additional water other than what you provide. But the assumption is, for me, is that I got a hive in my backyard, and they're going to find water someplace. I got a creek next door. I got a pond next door. I got a wet ditch from the rain, you know, out by the road. So my bees are going to get water. I'm pretty sure they're going to get water, and they're going to get as much as they need. What else does this show that I can be doing different as a beekeeper to enhance the quality and quantity of the life of my bees? This particular experiment, I'm not so sure that it, I mean, like you said, they're like, they're going to find it if they need it, right? They're, they're, their bees are resourceful. And so, you know, I mean, I guess if you live in areas where, where, you know, you have a, you have a long nectar dearth or, you know, if it's particularly dry year round, you, you might be able to set up some type of supplemental feeding or something like that. That would, that would certainly help out. The big part of that experiment is, is really, is mostly for researchers, to be honest, you know, the, the goal of the lab studies is to be able to provide good evidence for really expensive field trials. Like field trials, right? You to do good science with bees in a field, you got to have multiple apiaries, you know, dozens of colonies. That and, and and as I'm sure you know, that is hours and hours and hours of work just to even inspect them, right? Let alone do your data collection and whatever it is you're trying to manipulate out there in the field. But so the the cage studies, they're they're really they're really they're really inexpensive, really fast turnaround, and they provide great evidence for those field trials. But the goal is they have to mimic as much of you know life in the field as possible. Like you're already you're taking bees out of the colony, so they're they're you know being removed from all the hormone influence and the pheromones and and all just the 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 big environmental factors that sort of drive behavior in bees. So we can measure stuff about their health. So I think this provides, you know, at least an extra leg in that direction of, well, you know, we need to be taking better care of our bees in the hive. So we're having good inference once we get out into the field to, to do those more expensive experiments. Well, saving money is always a good thing to do. And that's what you would be doing. Tell me what the cages were. What did you make the cages out of? And, and what were they made out of? How many bees? That sort of thing. Just so I can envision what's going on here. I think the general standard that most people do is they take like 16 ounce solo cups and I'm not trying to, you know, plug solo unless you all <laughs> kind of get some advertising dollars for that, then you should. <laughs> but we'll contact them after this show, before yeah, the show. Yeah, you, should, you definitely should. Cause we buy our, we buy our cups straight from, for, straight from solo, you know, get a big box of a couple hundred of them. And so we modify those to be able to, you know, fit feeders in them put a bunch of ventilation in them, but also be able to like remove the dead bees daily. So it's basically a, you know, a 16 ounce solo cup with a lid, a couple of feeders sticking down in it. I take a Dremel and I, and I, and I sort of just dash, you know, holes in it for ventilation. And then that's pretty much it. Sometimes some people will cut up in the lids and, and put mesh down instead of a lid to provide even more ventilation. And yeah, if you, and if you do your job right and, you, and, and it works good, then, then those bees will, you know, they'll live pretty long. Not as long as I used to, apparently, but they live pretty long. <laughs> I was just curious as to how that was, just so I can envision all these bees in solo cups. Oh, yeah. And you asked how, how many bees. The number of bees, that's something that's been studied a bunch, too. And, and it's it's been a little bit of mixed results. But for the most part, the couple of studies that look at that say probably like 60 bees or so, like 50 to 60 bees per cage is pretty optimal for that sort of small environment. But, you know, it's not too few bees that they die off real quick. Like once the bees start getting really low in numbers, they don't live too long. But also if you have too many, there's, you know, you can't feed them fast enough. They're sort of overcrowding and they, they can't, you know, breathe as well. So, or, or at least they can't spread out and, and move around enough to, to be able to, to ventilate properly. That makes sense, especially too few bees. I'm trying to think of a cup full of 50 bees. That'd be an exciting adventure. All right, you've already determined that there's an outside factor that was affecting bees, but can you move that outside and say that's part of the problem beekeepers are having today is their bees aren't getting enough water? I don't think that's the case, but I'm not sure. That would be a tough question to answer. I think, I mean, I don't know if it's something that beekeepers are looking for, to be honest. Like if you're a hobbyist, right, and you and you just have your backyard, I think you, you, know, you assume that if it rains enough and, and there's a stream nearby, you're, you're you're probably doing okay. Whether or not we can measure that, though, for certain, I mean, that'd be a that'd be a great question to answer. 
we're just providing a, a small water source. It's not like they can even carry that much. So, you know, you know, bird baths, even though I hear these days they're apparently not that great for birds, but maybe they'll be just fine for your bees. So, you know, something something to that effect. They can only carry a couple of like micro liters or something at a time anyways. Well, one of the standard practices in parts of the U.S. is to provide a Boardman feeder with every colony and you just refresh the water when it gets empty. And I've tried that here in Ohio, and we certainly aren't a desert here, but sometimes we have hot, dry weather. And I've kept Boardman feeders, and they disappear. And I put them on at 8 in the morning, they're gone by lunch. And I don't know if it's because there's no water out there for them, or they're going, hey, why go way over there when I got it right here in the front door? And I don't know if there's a difference there, but I'm sitting here thinking, I'm going to put a Boardman feeder with water on it on every hive I've got this summer, just because. There's some other really interesting stuff too about, and this is, I think there's just there's just not enough of this in the research today about how different bees become different types of foragers. And it's not just that like you've got a nectar forager that one day decides to be a water forager. Like they they seem to, it just, there's some sort of genetic proclivity towards becoming a certain type of forager. And that tends to vary from colony to colony. So you know, you might even have access to water, but if for whatever reason the, the genetics aren't there, I mean, this is, this is a bit of a stretch saying this because, like I said, it's not represented very well in the in the literature. But what we do know is that there does there does seem to be some indication that there's there's a little bit more going on with you know with genetics and what a bee forage is than just you know necessarily what a colony needs at a given moment. So I, I would say that we should be focusing a much more effort into into that kind of thing. Because, like I said, if it is a problem, then then we would want to know, like, if is your stock of bees less likely to produce water foragers for you know for whatever reasons if the genetics just aren't there? So that could that could be a really that could be a, a path to answering your question, I think, of whether or not it's something beekeepers could do about water foraging. But I think we'd have to do a little bit more research first. That leads it to the next question: then the house bees, when a water forager goes out and she comes back. Are there house bees that will only take nectar, house bees that will only take water, and or then where does the water go? Also wonderful questions. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for the answers. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fast forward 10 years of research real quick. <laughs> I know that when nectar comes back to the hive and a house bee takes nectar, she will put it in a nearly empty or empty cell and hang it from the top and let it dehydrate. It'll either stay there and she will add to it or it will get moved to a cell that has dehydrated water slash honey already in it. So I wonder, water is also used to evapotranspiration. It will cool the interior of the hive as it evaporates. You've just opened up a whole bunch of doors here. What's going on? And maybe the answers are out there. I just haven't seen them over the years. So there's some new research that indicates there's a, like, like you mentioned, the dirty water, the turbid water earlier. That the, like the micronutritional content is also a big thing that 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 there's not it's not just that there's micronutrients in dirty water it's that pollen varies in its micronutritional content from season to season location to location and that there's some indication that they're supplementing what's missing from the seasonal pollen micronutrients with what they're getting from the water so it's definitely and yeah like the thermoregulation thing too for sure the story is definitely a lot deeper than. Than, than we currently understand, but terribly interesting. When I give water to bees, sometimes I will give them two choices. I will give them pure tap water. Well, I'll give them tap water that is scented. It's got something in it that smells. And I'll give them the same water that is not scented at all. And the scented water is all gone before they go over to the other one. I mean, it's easy to find. They bring it back and they say, here's what water smells like. Go look for some. And they'll find it because of the odor. I would guess that that's probably part of why they would rather go to a ditch with dirty water in it than they would go to a water faucet leaking water just because there's something else in that ditch water that doesn't exist in the in the faucet water. That makes sense? Oh, yeah. They, bees have this unbelievable ability to learn and unlearn rewards. And and it's all based around their their sense of smell. It's 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 really just fantastic. I'm going to go back to your research because you were focused specifically on caged bees in the laboratory, and you're going by colos 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 
the standards for lab standards and everything. I have two questions. One, will your research contribute to the improvement of the COLAS standards to make sure that water is provided to a certain level for the bees used in research? And then secondly, I don't think we ever really stated the life that was determined in the research for, you know, before and after or bees with and without. So I don't answer that, whichever one you want to in whichever order you'd like. So the, the making addendums to COLOS or, or mentioning the research, I'm, I'm certainly hoping to submit it and have them mention that in the standard pro- standardized protocols for sure. Certainly seems to make sense that, you know, given, given the, the types and levels of evidence that are presented to standardizing that stuff, this certainly falls, I think, right in line with that kind of thing. And so in the 1970s, the, the, the average median lifespan is what's in the median lifespan is typically what's measured by putting bees in cages. And that amounts to 50% population loss. The average median lifespan was, uh, it was about 34 days. And then in the past decade or the, from 2010 to 2019, in the, it was about 17 and a half days is what I found. So the and it's important to note though that that measurement in the 70s was pretty much on par with what is generally accepted in the field research for bee longevity as well. Now there's obviously a seasonal component, but if you exclude the long-lived winter bees, you know, the sort of overall average median lifespan for for bees in the field colonies that was established in the 50 the, in the 50s and the 60s was pretty much right on par i think it was 32 or maybe even 33 days for bees of that time period and so a lot of it when you, when you kind of put it in a bigger context you know us us researchers when we go to write a paper we're referencing the well established work and so when we ref, when, and we gain our inference on the well from the well established work so we're saying that oh okay the bees live this long during the active season. And when we measure this effect, this, this is the effect it had on their, you know, this, on their lifespan. So I think it's, it's even more critical to, to keep in mind that, you know, as we measure the effects of whatever it is we're measuring the effects of, that bees might have changed over the past 50 years. A lot has happened agriculturally over the past 50 years. And it might be important for us to perhaps revisit some of those earlier assertions before Varroa showed up, before all these different types of pesticides shows up, before we started altering the landscape and 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 eliminating all the all the additional forage that bees had access to. So so yeah, I think that was yeah, that was generally where I was going. One of the follow-up questions was how the genetics or different types of bees or bee races, you know, that's the big topic now is, you know, Carniolans versus Russian versus Italian versus whatever how that may have played into the selection or longevity of the bee in addition to the water. That was a really interesting part of this research was the, you know, trying to trying to think about well, what could be causing this or what could we do about it? And there's there's really limited research on it can you select for bee lifespan, right? There's there's not a whole lot of that going on. And and you know, breeding programs, you know, there were a little more interested in disease resistance and honey production and, and and those sorts of things, right? Because that's 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 the end game. But I think it's really interesting to consider that. Well, we know that, right? We know we know that varroa and viruses are, are reducing bee lifespan. We know that you know pesticides can have sublethal effects on bees and, re- and reduce bee lifespan. But what if you know in our efforts to select for disease resistance, what we were actually doing was selecting for shorter lifespans? Right. So like we measure disease resistance by inspecting colonies and they have lower disease loads. Well, I'm going to select I'm going to select from this colony with lower disease loads compared to this other one because they have high disease loads. But bees that don't live as long are less likely to pass on disease. So maybe we're just selecting (laughs) for shorter lived bees. Right. So that I think that was a really interesting, like like the thought experiment part of this work was like, well, can we can we test this? Right. You know, can we select for longer lived bees? Does it the colony do better or does that just is that just mean that they're going to do worse with diseases? You know, we don't really know. And then you get in the whole discussion about the productivity levels of a colony. So if you have a colony of shorter lived bees, are they going to produce more or less honey than sick bees that, that live longer, potentially sick or just longer living bees? There's actually a ton of research. I mean, and this is, I think this is one of the reasons that as a lab researcher, why we measure 
lifespan, right? Because it's it's sort of intuitive, right? Well, the longer a bee lives, the more it can forage, the, the better the colony does. But there's actually a ton, like, like I found more publications that link the amount of honey a colony produces that positively correlates with the lifespan of the bees in those colonies. Like that, that bit of science has been done, I think, in like every country in the world, probably multiple times over. So yeah, there's definitely a strong relationship there. And then we also, in the publication, one of the things I found was that the the, the change in lifespan over the past 50 years for the cage bees actually really strongly correlates with a decline in the average amount of honey produced per colony in the U.S. over the same time period. So it's you know it's a it's a it's an association, but it's a it's a fairly strong one, and and certainly has other evidence that that corroborates that type of thinking. Anthony, I want to go back. Basic question here on uh, I keep going back to the cage, just because I want to clear in my mind. In the cages that didn't get water, they just got sugar syrup and protein substitute. The cages that did get water then had a sugar syrup feeder, a water feeder, and a protein supplement feeder. You've got bees that are getting both and bees that are only getting sugar water. Did you notice, was there a difference in how much sugar water the bees lived in the cages that only had sugar water compared to the bees that had water and sugar water? If they were thirsty, the only place they could get a drink would be at the sugar syrup feeder. So were they eating more of that than than the other bees were, were eating a little bit of both? That makes sense? It does. And, and the answer is, is there was no difference. They pretty much consume the same amount of sugar syrup regardless of whether they had access to water or not. And then the, I mean, but the amount of sugar syrup compared to the amount of water was was like 10 times more or something like that. So they were only, I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head. It's been a long time since I looked at that data. But I know the water was like maybe a, a couple of microliters per bee per day, where it was in the the, the tens of, of microliters per bee per day for the sugar syrup. So it was definitely a lot. It was a lot more, but there was no difference between bees that that had, and this isn't in the paper. We Like we didn't publish this data, but I do remember doing this part of the analysis because when I first did that experiment, that was a lot of the data that I collected was, you know, me, me weighing the feeders every day and figuring out how much <laughs> had been taken out. And so, and so, yeah, so there was, there was no difference in the amount of sugar syrup overall that was consumed. Okay. Well, that makes it a little clearer. What's next? With this research, I'm really hoping that we can, we can establish the, the lifespan of bees in different parts of the country and the different parts of the world, right? Because that would be the that would be the sort of clincher would be, you know, is it just, ha- you know, is it really happening in the U.S. and not just to caged bees, right? Like if we were to go out and tag bees in, in different colonies around the U.S. and figure out their seasonal lifespans, would it, would it match up with those experiments that were done in the 50s and 60s that that sort of first laid that groundwork and if it is if it is happening with the field bees is it happening other places in the world we didn't really have i didn't really have access to enough publications from around the world like we had a nice you know huge huge number of publications between 1970 and now in the u.s that i could pull data from but it was sort of just you know, a smattering here and there in different parts of the world, a little bit of New Zealand, a little bit of Australia, you know, different different countries in Europe. Nothing consistent enough to say that there was a, a, a trend of, of change in lifespan happening. So that would be the next question I would ask as well is it if it's happening in other places or it's not happening in other places, but it is happening here, that gives us some pretty strong comparisons that we can make, whether it's, you know, genetically or or what the local, you know, access to food, what the beekeeping practices are, those types of things. So that gives us a lot of things that we could investigate to try to nail down a little bit further what's going on. Do Carniolans drink more water than Italians or vice versa? And the bees that you were using in your research were, I'm going to guess, at least close to being identical in terms of genetics from a queen or, well... I had a, I had about six rooftop colonies and I tried to keep... So we, we, for the most part, I can't remember, I'd, I'd have to check back uh, on the records exactly what type of queen it was. Like through most of our apiaries at the bee lab, we we tend, tended to get the same types of queens. There was a couple of years where we went out of our way to, at least on my rooftop colonies, to to mix up as much queen genetics as possible. Because usually when I'm, when I'm running experiments, I try to, you know, do multiple like multiple samplings of the same colonies. And then I'm able to separate 
you know, in in the in the analysis later, like whether genetics or not, local genetics has a, a strong effect on the outcome. So there was definitely a couple of years there. I'd have to go back in the in the records and see exactly what it was, but it's not like there's the whole world of options, right? You're only getting a, a handful of different types of queens in the US. So but I do know that we we definitely tried to mix it up as much as possible, at least for the for some of the research colonies. Some of the field experiments, it was more important to keep as much consistent genetics as possible, at least I think within within a given apiary. But yeah, I think it, hopefully that answers your question. Well, I can see a queen ad coming down the road here. Our bees drink more and live longer. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be an easy that, that that'd be an easy thing to test and promote for a breeder, I think. There you go. <laughs> yep. Each queen comes with its own thermos of water. <laughs> yeah, or get a queen branded water bottle along with our queens. That'll be in your uh, your ABF tote bag next year. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Right. <laughs> well, this has been really entertaining. What are you working on now? What research can you tell us about that you're working on that we can talk to you about next year? Yeah, so I'm 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 trying to wrap up and publish the the work of my dissertation while I've, I've and I've also just started a new job, a new postdoc at the at the USDA here in Beltsville, which the two things are entirely unrelated, which is great. You know, I'm trying to expand knowledge as, as much as possible wherever I can. But the the dissertation work is basically I'm I'm kind of expanding on the idea of lifespans a little bit, in that my general hypothesis is that. Not only does lifespan affect the life and and the the future of the colony, but I want to be able to I want to be able to measure it. But I want to be able to to take a sample of bees and tell you how a rough estimate of how old each bee is in that sample. Because as I, you know, I'm sure you're aware, you could you know unless that bee is newly emerged, it could be a week old, it could be three weeks old. You got it two in your hands, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between them. So I I. You know, after thousands and thousands of autopsies and and you know, crying undergraduate technicians collecting, helping to collect all that data, yeah, I'm starting to get to a point where I think that's that may be possible. So I, I definitely the the latter half of my PhD work was okay. Can I can I take bees of known ages, investigate their physiology, and use that to predict their ages, and then further the the physiologies that I think are are predictive of age. Can I actually relate them to colony loss? So I did a, uh, I got a whole bunch of work that's hoping to be published this year where I took archive samples from the, the Sentinel Apiary program. Is that something y'all are familiar with? Because it was a citizen science program, you know, hobbyist beekeepers send in their, their bees for row and OSEMA analysis. And, and they also send in their inspection data and the, and the mortality data, right? So I'm looking at, at colonies and I'm taking samples of bees in the fall that died the following winter. And I'm looking at their physiology in the fall and seeing if I can use those age-related physiologies to make predictions about whether they're going to die or not. Right. So you can you can imagine a situation, right, where like we we know we know things that that'll that'll basically change the age profile in a colony, right? That if you're if you if you have a queen event and those that the, that colony doesn't re, doesn't recover, right? Some of those old a lot of those older foragers, they're going to come back to the colony. And they're going to start trying to, you know, raise the new queen and and raise that next generation of bees because because there's no new young bees, right? Because the queen died. So that something like that's going to change the age profile of a colony. But if your bees, the same thing happens though, right? If the bees aren't living as long, right? If your foragers aren't living as long, your bees aren't living as long in general, right? Those younger bees become precocious foragers. That's going to change the age profile in the colony as well, right? So that's what I'm that's a, that's what I'm hoping to detect. With this work and 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 the work that I did with the the archive bees in the Sentinel Apiary program, at least preliminarily shows that there's a number of traits that I've that I show that are related to age that are are also predictive of of colony of overwinter mortality. So hopefully, this this can you know open up some new branches of research that that look into you know the age the age profile of a colony and and how that can contribute or at least hopefully be detectable of some type of, of any type of stressor in the colony, really, right? If you think about like, you know, we do all these different types of measurements, we check in the wax for pesticides, we're, we're you know, we're doing sugar shakes, we're trying to, you know, alcohol washes, trying to figure out the varroa loads, you know, changes in age profile could, I think, tell us about all of those things in one go. So, you know, whether or not it's practical, you know, practical for, you know, your everyday beekeeper, I'm not so sure yet. We're still smoothing out the research and trying to figure out just how accurate it is. But but that's the that's the short of the story, really. And if you could put that all into some sort of bee sensor, then you'll make your first and second million. That'd be 
<laughs> you know, short of tagging every bee in the colony, you're not, you don't really know anything about how old they are. So, and that's just, you know, it's not terribly, that's even, you know, less practical than, than what I'm suggesting. So. Well, Anthony, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show and look forward to having you back next year to talk about your new research. And we've been talking with Anthony Nierman of University of Maryland and soon to be of USDA ARS Beltsville Bee Lab. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been great. Well, congratulations on that, Anthony, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Kim. Y'all have a wonderful evening. So are you going to go out there and make sure you got all those Boardman feeders filled with water on your hives? Hey, you better believe it. I mean, this guy's got me convinced. And I'm going to dig a pond, and I'm going to put in a river, and I'm going to make sure my bees have all the water that they want from now on. It, I'm not going to say it's unbelievable, but it certainly woke me up to the importance of something that most people take for granted. Well, it's definitely inspired me to put that jacuzzi in I've been wanting. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like it's an obvious finding that bees with water live longer. But as he pointed out, it had never been actually articulated or confirmed through research what a difference it makes. When I put a jar of sugar syrup on a colony, I'm putting a jar of water on that colony. That's what I have always thought. They got water, they got food. What more could they ask for? But he's saying they can ask for more water without the sugar. And, and he convinced me. Yeah, and it doesn't matter whether it's tap water, spring yeah. water, pond water, or, you know, pool water. They just want water. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcast, wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on the reviews along the top of any web page. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Global Patties, Strong Microbials, and Better Bee for their longtime support of this podcast. Thanks to Blue Sky Bee Supply, Fisher's Bee Quick, and Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions and comments at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.